We're starting a new series today, uh, going to run for the next four weeks. It's all about festivals. The series is all about festivals. I was at a festival on Thursday. I was speaking at a festival, and uh, I drove down, and I, I arrived at the um, entrance, and uh, they, had a, they had a ticket ready for me, and I had to put on my wristband ready for the day that gave me access to everything we're doing. And um, we're believing as we teach through this series, this is going to open some stuff up and give real access to some of the things that God wants in each and every one of our lives. So grab a wristband, put it on. There'll be a helpful reminder. Thank you very much. And a helpful reminder, and that will be brilliant. And if you can wear all four of them by the end of a month, you probably need to shower more often. That is just the only piece of advice I have for you. Um, uh, we, came, we had a holiday early. My son is 16. He finished his GCSEs. He's our youngest child. And we thought, hey, we're going to do what we've not been able to do for, for you know, the best part of two decades. We're going to have a cheaper holiday. You know, because you can go out a little bit earlier before they hike up the prices for holidays. So we managed to get away early, and, and, but to do it and to do what we wanted to do, um, uh, we flew with a budget airline, and so we worked out really carefully how much luggage, because you had to buy the luggage. And um, I forget, every time I do this, I forget, I see the price of the flight, and I think to myself, that's a great price. And then, you know, do you want a seat? You know, it's like an extra 50 quid a person. And, you know, would you like to bring luggage? Oh, yeah, yeah, we probably should take some luggage. And so, you know, we'd really worked it out and thought it out really carefully. And we, so we told the kids, kids, listen, we got three children, uh, two girls and a boy. And we said, listen, everybody's got X amount of space. This is how much it is. This is the size of the case. This is the weight you're allowed to take. And then, then something happened. My middle child bought something for the holiday. <laughs> Thank you, Prisca. My, in her 10 kilograms of packing, she chose to buy a rainbow blow-up unicorn. Now, for those of you watching on live stream, this is real. <laughs> this is actually here. This is not some graphic we've inserted. Um, and then she says, I said, how are we going to blow this up? And she said those immortal words. Oh, you can do it, Dad. <laughs> I said, if you want me to collapse a lung, I can have a go at that. So then we had to go and buy a thing to blow it up with, and we ended up taking this on holiday. <laughs> I spent most of the week trying my best to pop it, like, you know, launching myself onto it from the side of the pool. I thought, if I land on this, it's history. But no, the little beggar kept going, <laughs> honestly, you know. I tried leaving it. We were staying in a villa and there was a bit of a drop off at the side. I thought if I put it near the side, the wind might take it. No! Things so heavy, it was immovable. It's unbelievable. Uh, what are you like as a packer? Like when you pack, are you a, um, a, like, you know, a minimalist packer? So you know you're going away, you've got exactly the right amount of outfits? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any of you, you overpack every single time. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's more car, yeah. Okay, okay. All right, okay. And then, and any of you like, you know, you're going to stuff it into the case, and the case is going to be rammed full, and then, is, would that be you? Come on, crowd participation, would that be you? If you, you ram the case absolutely full. All right, okay. Who leaves space for the junk you buy on holiday? You know, the tut. You know, you're walking around, they see you coming. And you buy these things, you think, I'll definitely wear that. Yeah, 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 that'll look great in the house. And you get home and you think to yourself, what was I thinking? And what, okay, let me ask this question. Who packs early? Like, you know, like way before, weeks before, you have piles of clothes in your bedroom, right? Come on, hands up. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, early packers. Who is, we're flying this morning. Wow, that tells you a lot about our church, actually. It's quite I intriguing. It's almost, it's almost insightful as we, we look at that. Oh, same people who got here late. Oh, <laughs> joking, joking, joking. 
joking. If you've just come on live stream, that's you as well. Uh, it's, um, it, it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, packing's an intriguing thing. I'm just going to put this with the rest of the festival equipment. Because, um, you know, every good festival needs a blow-up rainbow unicorn. And I have one available. Any offer, I'll take anything. Um, listen. Um, and we're going to talk about four festivals over the next four weeks that happened in the Bible. And the reason they happened in the Old Testament was to remind people of what God had done. It's to tell a story and have a reminder of what God had done in the life of his people, both corporately and individually. And then we're going to unpackage them. And I use that word on purpose, unpackage them to see what God wants to do in our lives. Because the same God who was working in the Old Testament is the same God who's working in the New Testament. And the truths of the Old Testament get outworked for us through the New Testament as the church. So today we're going to look at the festival of Pentecost. We're going to look at the festival of Pentecost, which in the New Testament is all about the Holy Spirit. But in the Old Testament, it's all about your capacity to pack. That's what it's about. It's about the capacity to pack because it's a celebration of the harvest. And they came, so if you've got your Bible, and I hope you bring a Bible to church, Leviticus chapter 23, uh, whether you're electronic. Hey, did you see the numbers this week about how often people look at their phones? Yeah, every 12 minutes, people check their social media. Could you not do that while I'm speaking, please? That'd be great. If you want to take pictures of me, we'll have a point where I pause. At that point, I'll be breathing in really deeply. All of the times, I need to talk, all right? So, um... That was your moment. So, we're going to unpack this. We're going to see where it goes. Because God, I think, wants to speak to us about Pentecost in our lives so that we can see the change and transformation for us. Is that okay? Leviticus chapter 23. We don't often dive into Leviticus, but the next four weeks we're going to be in and out of this book. Leviticus 23 verse 15. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, count off seven full weeks. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. From wherever you live, bring two loaves made of two tenths of an ephah of finest flour, baked with yeast as a wave offering of first fruits to the Lord. Present this with the bread, present with this bread seven male lambs, each a year old and without defect, one young bull and two rams. They will be a burnt offering to the Lord, together with their grain offerings and drink offerings, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Then the sacrifice, one male goat for a sin offering and two lambs, each a year old for a fellowship offering. The priest is to wave the two lambs before the Lord. Is it, have you ever tried to wave a sheep? <laughs> Just as I read that, I thought to myself, wouldn't that be fun to watch? A guy waving two sheep. Just try it with a unicorn and then sacrifice it. Um, with the bread for the first fruits, there is sacred offering to the Lord for the priest. On that same day, you to proclaim a sacred assembly and not do regular work. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. It's to be a reminder for the generations to come wherever you live. So, Pentecost, it is the celebration of harvest. They have seven weeks to get ready for this festival. Seven weeks. If you tell me something's happening in seven weeks, I put it in my diary and don't think about it till the last minute. Seven weeks they've got to get ready for this festival. And the average family had to bring that list that we just read. Can you imagine you're setting out on a journey with your family? Not only have you got to get the clothes with you and the food with you to get you from where you live to Jerusalem, but you have to bring this list. Can you put my little friend up on the screen, please? Where is he? Is he there? He's coming. This is what he has to bring. You ready? He has to bring two loaves, seven lambs. I mean, that's quite something. He has to bring a bull. Have you ever tried traveling anywhere with a bull? I mean... I'm struggling enough traveling with a 16-year-old boy. He's traveling with a bull, two rams, enough grain for the offering and probably to feed the animals, wine, well, we understand why he's got that if he's got seven loaves, a bull and two rams, a male goat, and then just for extras, two, two more lambs. That's some preparation. Like, that is a ridiculous, ridiculous amount of stuff that they have to turn up with. 
And they turn up to celebrate Pentecost and they need all of that to make all their relationships right. That's why they bring it. They bring it to make their relationship with God right. They bring it to make their relationship with each other right. And they have to go through a prescribed set of moves and actions to get them to the point where their relationship with God is where it should be and their relationship with each other is where it should be. And every year, they do this. They make this journey. Thank God we don't need this. I mean, thank God that as Mary said earlier, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid every sacrifice. Uh, He paid every price. He was every offering. There's not an extra. There's not a something more. There's not an added on that you've got to turn up with and you've got to go, if I don't do this, I don't make it. Every relationship of yours that you think's broken actually doesn't need you to sacrifice something. Jesus has already given it. What you've got to do is step into the sacrifice. Pentecost then and Pentecost now are actually two really different things. You see, some festivals, they kind of carry through the cross. But other festivals, they're transformed by the cross. And Pentecost goes from a celebration of harvest, a celebration of what it calls the first fruits, to a realization that Jesus is the first fruit, that he has given the ultimate sacrifice, and that we are supposed to live free. Listen, church, the Bible is clear. It is for freedom that God has set us free. Uh, You're not supposed to be tied down. You're not supposed to be limited. You're not supposed to be held by. You're supposed to live free. And Pentecost is that moment of reminder that God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, wants to ignite something, release something, empower something, and fire something inside of you so that you can live free, fully free. Not held down, not held back, not limited in any way. God wants to set you free. He is in the business of doing it. He will stay in the business of doing it. We can let relationships stop us. Uh, Let me tell you, the things that mess me up the most are people. You? Not you. My intonation was slightly wrong there. Is it the same for you? People. I was talking to a pastor this week and who said these immortal words to me. Man, it'd be easy to run a church if there were no people in it. I said, no, it's not true of our church. People. Relationship with God, we put right in a moment. But our relationship with one another, we've got to keep working through and working on. And Pentecost, are you ready, is as much about that as it is about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because God wants to unpackage you. Then and now. In the then of Pentecost, they had to wait 50 days before they could celebrate it. Even those first disciples, Jesus died on the cross His death, that complete sacrifice has happened and he's ascended to heaven and then he tells them to wait. So the death of Jesus was not enough for the disciples to do their mission. You just being a follower of Jesus is not enough for you to outwork his destiny for your life. You just having put your hand up and really meant it and prayed a prayer and weekly, daily trying to follow him, let me tell you, it's not enough for the mission he's given you for your life. He tells them to wait. They spend this 50 days in and around a room somewhere in Jerusalem, maybe an upstairs room, some space that they find themselves in for 50 days. They pray and they talk and they engage with one another. What's happening? Oh, it's that clash of people you have been in a room with people for a little bit too long 50 days 120 people do you think maybe they had a few moments you know what I mean 
Like, you know, when your family gets together, the extended family, and you, oh, someone really meant it. And it starts off really well. Everyone's friendly. You go through all the usual questions. How was your drive? How long did it take you to get here? You know, have you got a new car? And that's it. Usually at that point, we blokes are done in terms of engagement. What, 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 are, we, what are we talking about? You know, and, and, and then as the day gets on, a few little memories reoccur, a little bit of tension. Now imagine that times 50. Who's cooking now? Who's cooking today? Whose turn is it? Oh, you can imagine the tension in that room. Wait. <laughs> you see, they could have been so focused on what Jesus did that they forgot that he had something more for them. And so he put them in a little pressure cooker to work on who they were so that they were ready. He put a little bit of tension into the scenario so that they could be changed. It's a then and a now and then. They had to wait 20 days, but I want to tell you this. 50 days, but I want to tell you this. Pentecost is here. It, it, we don't have to say, okay, from today, if you wait 50 days, God, God's going to meet you. That's not how it works. I don't know if you noticed, but weight's not big in our culture. Like, we're not good at it, are we? Come on. We're not good at waiting, you know. You want next day delivery, and if it's not there by midday, you're wondering what's happened. You know, everything's got an instantaneous nature to it. You can get your loan approved in, you know, 30 seconds. Uh, you, can, you can buy this and buy that and do this and do that. You can book all this and do all these things. We like the immediate, and I think God gets that. Because the wait was a one-off wait. It was a wait for the early church. And then when they waited, there is no wait that happens again. Anytime you work your way through the, the, the Acts of the Apostles and you see people being filled with the Holy Spirit, it doesn't say they became a follower of Jesus and then they waited 50 days. It doesn't say they became a follower of Jesus and then they went into an upper room and had a bit of time together. It says this, they became a follower of Jesus, they believed, they were baptized and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. There wasn't a pause moment. Church, God wants you filled to overflowing with his Holy Spirit. He wants you empowered for every day of your life, for every moment of every day of your life. He wants you to live in a place of relationship with him where intimacy is strong because he is filling you by the power of his Holy Spirit. Isaiah 55 puts it best like this. Come, all who are thirsty and drink. The invitation is wide open to you. It's a then and a now kind of thing. And then they travel to God, but now God meets us where we are. I mean, thank God that although we have a great building and we'll have a better building soon, that although all this is here, actually, it's not about the building. It's just about us opening ourselves to him and saying, God, are you there? And the answer is always yes. Even when you don't get the answer, the answer is still yes. Even when you don't feel like he's there and situation doesn't look like he's there, the answer is still yes, he is there. Then they had to travel to him, but now he is here. And then they paid for their sacrifices. If you work out, which I did, how much that number of lambs, goats, bread, wine, depends on the quality of wine, bull, depends on the quality of bull. Let me tell you, I was unclear about the cost of a bull. I mean, they start a cheap, a cheap bull, right? I'm not sure the potency of this particular animal, but a cheap bull is probably worth around about 800 pounds. But if you want to get into high-end purchasing, you're talking north of five grand for a decent bull, honestly. Lamb's about 70 pounds, year-old lamb, younger lamb, a little bit cheaper. 70 pounds, you start to work it out and you realize for this family to pay for this one day event, it's thousands. It's thousands. It's no wonder they take this gap to get ready. 
Because we read it and we think, man, they just went along and made a sacrifice. But no, they, they, they paid. And they paid a price to be there. And so did Jesus. You see, the now is we don't have to pay for the sacrifice. The now is that, that it, it, it's, we're debt free. The now is pressure off. The now is we can be in that relationship with God because of what Jesus did. I'm so glad I don't have to deal with my sin. I'm so glad I don't have to deal with the brokenness of me. But that God is dealing with it on my behalf. And he's not asking me to pay for him to deal with it. Because that's our culture, isn't it? We don't deal with things ourselves. We'll pay someone to deal with it. We don't fix our car. We pay someone to deal with it. We, we, we don't do our DIY like generations before did. We pay someone to do it. Because we're saying there's a value on our time that means we want to use our money another way. And Jesus said, listen, you don't need to deal with your sin. I've paid to deal with it. The very fundamental thing that is not right with us, he makes right with us at his own cost. In Pentecost then, they had to pack everything. Can you imagine doing that journey as a family with all those animals? Walking from wherever you live to Jerusalem with all of that, herding them along. But in Pentecost now, it's not what we pack. It's what God's packed into us. You see, Pentecost today is about the fact that God has pre-packed you and our responsibility is to unpack our lives. He has pre-packed you. He, he has, when he filled you with his Holy Spirit, he has put everything in you you need. Everything. There's nothing missing in you. Man, stop chasing around trying to find you. It's in you. Stop, stop trying to find, oh, I've got, got, to, got to know what my destiny is. Just, can you take your foot off the gas for a minute on trying to find your destiny and your purpose and just go, God, I'm in you. You're in me. If the whole of you is in me, and that's pretty mind-blowing, then can I trust you that you got this? God, can I trust you that you got this when it don't look like it? When it just does not feel like it. Can I trust you that you've got this? Pentecost is about unpacking you. 1 Peter 2 verse 3 in the Passion Version reads like this. God has given us everything we could ever need for life and complete devotion to God. It has been deposited in us by his divine power. Everything you need has been deposited in you by his, everything. Do you know what that means in the Greek? Everything. All things. Everything you can think of, everything you can come up with, has been deposited in you already by his divine power. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, God is not giving you a moment with him. Listen, if you have a moment with God when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and, and, and it's emotional or it's, as Andy said earlier, it's tangible, that's great. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the be-all and end-all of it. Uh, listen, let me tell you. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit and you start speaking in other tongues, it's great. But it is not the be-all and end-all of being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's not the purpose of why he's done it. He's filled you with his Holy Spirit to give you power to be effective in reaching everything he has for you, in doing everything he wants you to do. And he's filling you with his Holy Spirit because he wants to be with you. Intimately with you. That he is packing into you. And he is packing into me everything we need for living for him. Everything we need for our life and destiny. In a few moments, we're, we're going to pray and we're going to open the altar and we're going to pray for people who've never been filled with the Holy Spirit and those who have been filled with the Holy Spirit before and we're saying, God, I recognize I just need more 
of you. I need more of you. I need you to pour it in and pour it in so that it overflows from my life. Before we do that, let me ask you this question. Have you ever been looking for something in a bag and you can't find it? Like, you know, you know your keys are in there. You know they're in there. And you open the bag. And, and the problem is not that the keys aren't in there. The problem's the other stuff. It's the stuff that's in the bag that your keys are hidden amongst. And you start to sort of empty the bag, trying to find the thing that you're looking for, the keys that you're looking for. You're emptying the bag. And you know, if you're anything like me, my bag that I used to work has got compartments. And I don't always put the same things back in the same places. And I start to go through the different compartments of the bag. It's going to be in here somewhere definitely going to be in here somewhere and then you sort of unzip one and then you unzip another and then you open it and everything in that compartment falls out on the tube scrabbling along the floor of the tube you're thinking to yourself this was last cleaned in the 60s it's just like you know you're doing all you're putting all that ah what's going on here and then you find it our problem is not that we're filled not filled with the holy spirit it's the other stuff My problem is not that I've not been filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not that God's not doing a work in me. It's there's other stuff in me. All right, let me ask this question. Um, Do you ever get privately? Don't put your hand up and respond. Or do, if you really want to. Do you ever get really cross? But when you're in public... You don't show it. And then when you're at home, something less irritating seems to set you off even more. Like, you know. Or when you're driving. Yellow boxes. Those hashed boxes on the road. Like you stop because there's no way out the box on the other side. And so you stop because you're a good driver like me. And then some bandit <laughs> cuts in and sits in the yellow box. Oh. Oh. I sort of reach into Stuart for a response. And sometimes what I pull out is not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Sometimes we're sat having dinner, and um, we're, sat, we're sat around the dinner table, and, um, you know, depending on boyfriends or girlfriends being there, depends on, you know, what happens when somebody presses someone's button at the table. Is your family anything like that? Uh, you, know, you know, you can feel someone presses someone's button, you, you watch them, you watch them reach into themselves for a response, and if there's other people there, oh, what a lovely thing to say. There's not anybody else there. The Tasmanian devil appears at our dinner table. <laughs> we, we often talk about that. And we talk about that being, oh, that's, well, you know, that's the real me. Like, you know, I don't like it. I don't like that about myself. But, you know, when I let my guard down with my family or my really close friends, they, they, they see the real me. I, I just don't think that's true. I actually don't even think it's biblical. I think the biblical phrase is this. They see the old you. Uh, Let let me read it to you. From um, Ephesians chapter 4. Paul writes this, right? He says this. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, to be, be made new in the attitudes of your mind and to put on the new self, Created to be like God. Whoa. There is a self in me. There is a self in you that is created to be just like God. You have been or should be filled with the Holy Spirit so that you can reflect who God is to the world around you. That you can demonstrate it with power. You can demonstrate it with love and show who it is. The best phrase for me is this, God, less of me and more of you. 
And so I've recognized that actually my best thing that I can do for my growth, I can't make myself more like God. But I can make myself less like me. I can deal with some of the stuff in me. And and I'm finding this more and more. The circumstances that impact my life, God is not doing it to make me like him, but to make me less like me. Because he's already made me like him by filling me with his Holy Spirit. He's already made you like him by filling you with the Holy Spirit. Everything, let me say it again, everything you need for life and complete devotion to God has been deposited in you. You just got to... Open the bag of your life and get out some of those things that get in the way. D.L. Moody said it like this. I believe firmly that the moment our hearts are emptied of pride, selfishness, ambition, and everything that is contrary to God's laws, the Holy Spirit will fill every corner of our hearts. But if we're filled with pride, conceit, ambition, and the world, there is no room for the Spirit of God. We must be emptied before we can be filled. I've got to get rid of a few things in me. See if this list resonates with you. I've got to deal with some of my opinions. I've got to deal with some of my prejudices. I've got to deal with some of my plans. I've got to deal with some of my thought processes. I got to deal with some of my negativity. I got to deal with some parts of my heart that I'd hate to show you. I got to deal with my mind. And God's just going, You're going to make space for me. And then we make space for him, and he says, This is brilliant. Do you want to make some more space for me? And we make a little bit more space as we grow and as we kill that old person that is in our hearts and lives. And they said, do you want to be a bit more space for me? Because I've been a Christian now for 36 years. And God keeps finding more stuff. Oh, man, I wish he'd done it day one. I was 10. That could just be a memory. But he doesn't. He works it through the process of our lives. And he keeps coming back and going, so are you going to surrender that now? Are you going to give up a little bit more of that? Oh, you've created that way of thinking in your head. Do you want to kill that? And my role is to keep coming back and surrendering to him. God is ready to assume full responsibility for a life wholly surrendered to him. God, come on church, why don't you stand to your feet? I'm going to pray a simple prayer and then we're going to open the altar. Lord, there's stuff in me that I don't like. I just surrender it again to you. Would you, Lord, examine my heart, our hearts, our lives, our thoughts, our opinions, our prejudices, our minds. And as we surrender them, we're going to ask you to fill us again with your Holy Spirit. If you want to respond and you're saying, God, This festival, this reminder, I'm coming to you to wait and be filled. Why don't you slide out your seat? You're saying, God, I realize I need to be filled afresh, filled again. And as the band's playing, come on, church, come fill the altar.